Kia ora, greetings. I'm Andre Whitaker. Welcome to Mana Talanoa, this session which is Legends of League. And it's my pleasure to be speaking to a person who actually started off playing rugby for Mana or Two, represented Mana or Two, represented Wellington, and then actually got picked up to play professional rugby league for Witness. And amongst that time, he spent some time, a little bit of time playing rugby league for Wainui Mata, made the Kiwis and um, had a very distinguished career, uh, career in, in rugby league. So it's my pleasure to welcome Emosi Koloto. Emosi, mālo e lele. Welcome. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, kia ora and mālo e lele. Yeah, Thanks well, for the opportunity. Great to see you and great to talk. And let's, let's talk about um, your, uh, your background. You were born in Tonga. So talk us through, you know, your, your early days, your home life back in, back in Tonga. Whereabouts in Tonga you were from, the Koloto family? Yeah, I was uh, I was born in a uh, village called Tatakomotonga in uh, Nuku, in Tongataku, which is the main island of Tonga. My father was a, a church minister, and uh, he his job is to be a um, minister of a village church for every three or four years. Then he's allocated to another village. So most of our kids, all well, yeah, all of our kids were born in different villages. And uh, I was, um, my, my father was from, from so I, that was in 1965. And uh, we moved around uh, up until uh, 1994, 90, no, sorry. Then I went to high school. There was after about four or five, um, moving from village to village and, uh, then I, uh, I passed the main uh, exams in Tonga where you, you get to go to the top school in, in Tonga, the top high school, which is a big achievement for the Tongan um, kids to uh, attend Tonga High School. And uh, uh, the first person in our family, which is a big achievement you know, um, in, in our community. Uh, it's very, very, it's only the, the top uh, students get wow. to, get to go to Tonga High School. So yeah. that was in 94, 95, uh, 96, sorry, is it 70? I'm talking about the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 76, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's interesting, uh, and, also, and your, your father being a minister and then having that great achievement in education, the family must have been very proud that you were the first one to do that. Yeah, um, I mean, growing, uh, growing up with uh, with our family, my dad was just focusing mainly on his role as a as a minister, and uh, you know um, it's it, it was really a, a kind of a hard um, life in terms of not being settled anywhere, you know, to build up um, uh, a home because our home was only for three years, and then we moved to another home, and what as we, we nearly get settled in that place, we have to. We, got another call to move to another place. Mm. So, but the good thing about that is we got, we got to meet a lot of people and new friends and uh, relatives that we, yeah, you know, that we don't normally see. So yeah. it was really good to, um, to be in that kind of uh, environment. And my father was pretty um, strict, uh, mm. very traditions. Mm. So mm. I grew up in the household where uh, I was family comes first, you know, a very re religious uh, family and uh, hardworking, but yes, uh, very, uh, very poor. I mean, most most Tongan families didn't have any financial um, mm. uh, income, but you know, but we never felt like that we were hungry or starved from because there's always food there. There's uh, yes, yeah, yeah, plantation yeah. and fish and you know every every um household would have their own little uh chicken farm or pigs or you know or even go to fishing go fishing for our meals so or even the, when the neighbors go that we share so it was really that's fascinating cool um to grow up and, on. yeah and then to come from that environment like you said in a kind of a traditional um uh, village setting and then moved to Palmerston North, uh, to New Zealand. What, what brought the family to New Zealand or yourself to, to New Zealand? Yeah, well, well when I, I mentioned before that I passed my exams to uh, the top high school in New Zealand, my brother was uh, 
over here in New Zealand, older brother. And uh, he, he uh, promised me that he's going to bring me over to New Zealand if I pass my exams. So in 1976, uh, I passed my exams, went to high school for one year. And my brother um, uh, organized and, and got me a visa and paid for my airfare and uh, came over in 70, uh, December 78 and um, stayed with him and his wife. So mm. it was a really uh, strange uh, place for me as a young 13 years old to arrive in a uh, strange um, airport where all these, you know, big planes and uh, uh, everything all new and it was slightly cold in Auckland mm. compared to Tonga mm. and yeah. yeah. And, and then we went straight to Palmerston North where there was hardly any um, Pacific Islander there. Um, the school I went to is Palmy Boys. There was only uh, probably about two or three Samoans there, uh, no more than 30 Maoris and the total mm. number of uh, mm. students were about 1500 students at the Palmy Boys. So I was the only Tongan who, the first Tongan ever to, met, to go to Palmy Boys. Well, you would have you would have been a real a real novelty in some respects in that way. So, how how, how did you um sort of been uh been part of the community there, been part of a place where there weren't many Pacific Islanders? You're the only Tongan. What were the sort of things that you did to sort of um, be part of that community? Oh, it was tough. It was really tough for me as a young boy who, uh, you know, living with, not with my parents where I can do what I like. So because there's a certain rules when you're staying with a, uh, my brother and his, his wife, um, mm. you know, we don't have beds in Tonga. So you have to make your bed every, every morning and we don't do dishes. The sisters do the dishes back home in Tonga. So uh. I have to have turns in doing the dishes and mowing the lawn and things like that. So well. it, it was, um, it's a culture shock for me, you know, as a young person and just trying to learn about the, uh, the food. There was different food, mm. you know, it was mm. strange food for me and uh, just no brown people around Palmerston North and the weather wasn't the best, you know. Yeah, yeah. it was really a, a culture shock. And then as far as things like your Tongan language, you, you pretty much was main, maintaining that in the home or did you need to make more of an effort with English? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I spoke hardly any English when I first arrived. So, yeah. you know, at school, kids was being the, the only tongue in there. So it was challenging, these young kids teasing you and all that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. but I was, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I was quite a, a big lad for my age when I first arrived. And I was, you know, in the same class as most Palangis. And they were only up this height on me. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, stay here yeah. to watch what they say to me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously arriving here with, um, as you said, you're a little bit bigger than the other people around the school. Um, you naturally progressed to rugby. Was rugby the first um, uh, kind of first sport that you really got into? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I grew up in uh, Tonga when uh, my my father's village, Nukunuku, where we were uh, there for three years and I was only about eight or nine then, uh, our, we had a village team. And I used to uh, sneak out from my mum's chores to go and watch these uh, teams training. Mm. So I had, um, uh, there was um, uh, like three or four, um, five international players in the team. Right. Uh, when, they, when they have uh, training uh, games with another team, there was other international there. So, you know, we, I heard about their names on the radio and everyone talking about their names, but actually down at training to watch them it was, you know, it was really cool for, for a young kid. And um, I always loved playing rugby and, you know, at school in Tonga, we played touch before, before assembly, morning break and lunch and then after school. That's all we did. It was just playing touch and, you know, you pick up all these skills. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nothing like the backyard backyard football, eh, to improve your skills. So yeah. when you're in Palmy, then you played club rugby there, and then you went on to play for Manawatu. or two. Who was the club you played for in Manawatu or two in Palmy? Oh, I um, um, when I left Palmy Boys, I went to um, uh, I played for the university's team, uh, yeah. club, 
because I went to teach training college, college because I was advised by my coach in Palmerston North that um, you know, it's a good career for young men who haven't really, uh, um, didn't really know any direction really when I left high school. It was just all rugby. Um, but my, um, I must admit that, that Ian Cahoon was my uh, first team coach in Palmy Boys for four years. Yeah. He was the, the one that really uh, had a lot of um, uh, um, influence in my discipline and in my career is, you know, to take rugby seriously. And uh, so he supported me and, and helped me to um, go to teach training college. And mm-hmm. I was playing for university there. And uh, that was in 1984. Uh, and mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. we had a tour to... Europe with the New Zealand Universities team, and our our captain was David Kerr, was right. our New Zealand yeah, captain, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, our hooker was Sean Fitzpatrick, yeah, uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, wow. and our um, um, another flanker was Mike Brewer, uh, mm. yeah, big, so, big names in the sports, you know, they all yes. went on to be um, of major All Blacks, and. Oh. Um, there was uh, a, must have been, uh, uh, you must have been proud of playing alongside them, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I only just left school and I was playing for New Zealand universities with all these guys that, um, mm. uh, you know, playing for Auckland University. University in Auckland were probably uh, in the top two, top three in their club competitions. And um, we toured Europe, um, uh, England, Ireland, France and Italy, and we were unbeaten for that for, I think it was about 13 games we played. And uh, Massive. there was Massive, a, yeah. most of the players in the uh, in that team were all playing super well, provincial rugby. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. some uh, went on to play for the All Blacks or trial for the All Blacks. Yeah, yeah, that's that's team. really really strong. The university rugby and actually Manawa too. You know, in that division they played in back then, uh, a yeah. lot of the players went on and went to other districts. So like you, you then came to Wellington. What was the motivation to come to Wellington? What what in, what enticed you to go there? Yeah, I, I was on, well, I played for Tonga in 1986 and the World Cup, New Zealand, Rugby World Cup in 87. And I, um, uh, I, I put myself um, to be available for the All Black selection. So for three years I was playing for, for Manawa 2 and I had a pretty good run with Manawa 2 for those three years. And I, had, I, I thought I had a good chance of making the All Blacks. And uh, um, you know, 87's World Cup and these young other other players that we played up together in the age um, um, grades, like Michael Jones, Jensen Brook, mm. uh, mm. to name two who we are playing. We played together in North Islands under um, under 16 and under, under 18s. Fabulous, and, yeah. Um, yeah. And there was a lot of... Um, um, I, I thought I had a pretty good chance of making the All Blacks, but I never uh, really... Um, yeah, I, I didn't get selected for the 87 World Cup. So I, I, I made the New Zealand Sevens and, I, you know, again, I thought that I, I might have a good um, a chance. But um, just watching all these other guys coming past, going past me to the, make the All Blacks, they were all playing for, for a bigger provincial side like Auckland and Canterbury yeah. and Wellington. Yeah. And uh, in 1987, I think uh, Murray Max said, retired a year before so uh, yep. I thought I might try some one of the big threes and Wellington was a uh, yep. there was a position there uh, they were still looking for number eight so and and then I um, I said something on the newspaper uh, local paper that I would be interested in moving somewhere to get a better chance of uh, better exposure for to be selected for the All Blacks yeah and Avalon came came in to um, contact me to see if I can go and play for Avalon and uh it was um, uh, really gave me the opportunity to um, try out for Wellington yeah. and got picked for Wellington team. And uh, um, yeah, so that was in 1988. Okay. And, so at, at Avalon, who were the players around you at Avalon? Because Avalon was fairly strong back in those days. Um, so yeah, who, yeah, yeah. Who were, some of, who were some of the other fellows in the team with you? Um, I think, like, I can't remember because it's been a while now, but I, I, I remember Chris Trukeski. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was an all black too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, the hooker, I played with him for Wellington. That's right, yeah, yeah. 
and my his name. He was the captain. That's right, you Captain Before, Wellington. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. For Avalon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was in '88, and we played uh, Wells um, mm. in Wellington, and that's the game that uh, the witness uh, coach was on holiday in Wales. He had a, a holiday home in Wales, and he happened to um, be watching this game of rugby between Wales and Wellington, and I, I had a pretty good game in that game, and he uh, rung me the day after uh, yeah. to see if I'm... Uh, interested in playing league and uh, you know I, I to be honest I never really uh, thought about playing league because I was like rugby union from when I was born and that was it I didn't even thought about playing league and mm. uh, during that time it was um, rugby union it was still amateurs and they were talking about becoming professional for a long time for a few years you know this, this is in 1988 and we've had rugby union players uh, playing overseas in France and Italy and and they were getting paid, but it's yes, supposed yeah, to be amateurs, yeah. you know. Even I myself was playing uh, a season in Italy and, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, amateur rugby players getting paid and uh, everything, your airfares and your accommodation and cars were given and, yeah, they were, that, that was really... Um, around that time when, when I got that call from Doug Lawton, mm. he, uh, I was quite um, curious to see whether they, they were serious or, or yeah. whether, you know, it's, a, it's an option for me because yeah. my goal yeah. was at, at the time was to play for the, for the All Blacks, to be the, um, I, I couldn't, during that time, I didn't know whether there was any Tongan yeah. played for the All Blacks then or not so that was one of my um, goals yeah well that was an interesting time because there was a, as you said it was the early days before professional really kicked off and players like uh i remember like for example john gallagher from wellington you know yep. went to play professionally in the uk um john schuster again from wellington went to play for the newcastle knights and then of course matthew ridge um a, a, a bit earlier on for for, for yep. matley so I could see for you, you know, there were opportunities that were just on the fringes of the All Blacks and seeing other players that were taking league opportunities. So it seemed a natural thing for you to do, I guess. And, I was and, actually, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was playing with Schuster and um, uh, Gallagher, Gallagher mm. uh, for Wellington mm. in, mm. in 88. And I, I moved over to the league in uh, September 88. And then... The rest start coming over after me. It was Fran Bodica, it was um, Gallagher, yeah. it was Mark Brook Cowden. So, you know, and a lot of the All Blacks went over to Australia. That's right. I, mean, yeah. I, I was yeah. probably before me, was, the only one that I could remember was Doug Rollison. Yeah. From yeah. Manawa 2 and yeah. Ken Lambert. That's right, going way back. Ken Lambert, yeah, yeah. They, they were Ken, too, yeah. And I remember Ken. Ken Ken Lambert used to have a pub in Palmerston North that all the there was famous it's for. Right. for. I yeah, remember um, right. uh, there was quite quite a famous place for rugby players and actually league players because of his background as well. So tell us about Witness. You know, um, understand um, Kurt Sorensen was there, who's also of Tongan heritage, and you yeah. found out a bit later on that you had a connection. But what what was it like there? Who were some of the players? Yeah. Yeah, I um, when I first arrived in uh, uh, Witness, uh, Kurt was. They call him King Kurt uh, at Witness. He he was in partnership with uh, Big Jim Mills. I, I don't know whether you remember. Yeah, yeah I do. Only, I do know of him. Yeah. I had a band from New Zealand. Yeah. Because uh, one of the New Zealand, England, Great Britain, Kiwis test, and he stomped on one of the Kiwi uh, players. That's right, on John Greengrass's um, head. Um, yeah, I understand right. they're very good friends now, but um, that was yeah. that was a huge that was a huge moment. Um, uh, there was a blight for the game. But yeah, so you were there with those guys, some pretty hard, hard men there. You know. Yes, um, Kurt Sorensen was there. I met him. We, we, my mum told me that we're related. So I told Kurt that his uh, great grandmother or grandmother was uh, sisters with my great grandmother. So we had a connection already. And, and Kurt was 
um, looking after me there. It's a young new uh, Kiwi, and he's been the the like the mayor of Witness at the time. He was basically, you know, couldn't do anything wrong there. And yeah. uh, Joe Grimmer, he was the other one that uh, yeah. he was another Kiwi. But um, the Witness team in that year, they won the championship the year before. And when I arrived there, that was one of the selling points um, from Dougie Lawton, was that I'll be going over to a winning uh, team. You know, mm. uh, he, he sent me a video of their final, um, one of their finals. And I thought, oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind playing in front of 40,000 people every week. I thought that, that's what it's going to be like. And uh, um, Dougie Lawton was there and uh, he looked after me. He signed me up. Uh, uh, there was a very, it's a very small town witness. It's a bit like, uh, uh, probably like Wanu Maha. Yeah, yeah. Very small town. There was only 60,000 people uh, in witness, but next door is St. Helens, Wiggins, um, Leeds mm. is about an hour from witness. St. Helens is only 15 minutes drive. Wigan is probably about uh, 25 minute drive from yep. witness. Yeah. So all these big name rugby teams, we are all in North uh, West England. They're all very yeah. close together. So well, you you mentioned Wainu Mata there. So as part of part of that time, uh, which is when I obviously first met you when you you came over, what what got you to come and play for Wainu Mata? What 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 sort of brought you back back into um you know you played a yeah. handful of games for Wainu Mata um, back about around about yeah. 89, 90 kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, well, I I came back the year before after my first year in eighty eight, eighty nine. I came back to um, uh, New Zealand and I wanted to play for the Kiwis. So after the following year, eighty nine ninety uh, season, um, I was told that um, if I want to make the the Kiwis, I'll have to come back to New Zealand to play. But I I already signed a contract with um, North Sydney. Um, Sorry, I signed with Manly. Mm. Um, mm. The rules in those days, the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, order team, the lowest teams yep. in order, would have the first priority for any um, overseas players to sign I up. See. In yeah, in the draft, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, because um, Graham Law was coaching uh, Wigan, um, Manly, mm. and I signed up to play with him, play for, his, for Manly. And... Um, North Sydney came and 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 wants to sign me up, and at the same time, I uh, I was talking with New Zealand Rugby League, and I was told by New Zealand Rugby League, uh, you're not going to be selected for the Kiwis because if you go to Australia, you have to come back to New Zealand and and play a club um, for a club here, and then trial for the Kiwis before you'll be considered for the team. And that's so, I contact Ken Laban. Yeah, contact Ken Laban, and uh, yeah, it was Ken who uh, organised um, me to come come over to Wainui. That's right. So we were lucky enough to have um, you know your Kiwi Troll um, games, so to speak, playing 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 for us down there. Tell me just a little bit about changing from rugby to league. What were some of the differences? I spoke to Tana a little Umanga a little bit earlier, and he's a back, and he talked about. Yeah. It was a bit more physical in the league backs at that time compared to rugby. What was it like? You're a forward. You're a flanker, number eight, being yep. in the forwards for for witness. What was some of the adjustments you might have had to make? No oh, man, I when I watched the league on TV, I thought to myself, you know, because you know the Australian uh, uh, prems uh, was live on TV in New Zealand. Yeah. Yep. So I followed rugby league, and I thought they were a pretty easy game to play. All you have to do is catch the ball, run straight, and then if somebody runs to you, you tackle. So, you know, I was pretty confident that I'll, I'll pick the league just like that. And, uh, uh, man, my first year, uh, two, first two or three years, I was learning the game. Uh, there's, there's more to, to league than just running and, and uh, tackling. And uh, um, I, my technique in, uh, from rugby, because as a number eight or, or loose forward, I have to follow the ball around, chase, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like number seven, number eight, just follow the ball 
and set it up for the backs. In rugby league, you don't do that. You just, you know, you just stay on your line, move up, go back, you know. And that was hard because we don't do a lot of up and down in the union. Mm. We just mm. like a, a, a just a straight run, sort of. Same yeah, way. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where in league is a small, fast sprint and yeah. down and up and forward, you know. And and then you get two or three people tackling you every time you run with the ball in in league. Yeah. That's really tough. Where in, in union you only get one, and then. They only grab you. They don't hit you. They just <laughs> grab you. <laughs> and then, yeah, you know, yeah. after a, a game of rugby union for after 80 minutes, you might get tackled a couple of times, you know, yeah. or even get, if you're forwards, it's only the number eight will get run the ball and the rest would probably touch the ball not, not that many times in those, those days. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in rugby league, it was tough. It was hard. It was physical. It was fast. So my fitness... Yeah had to improve i had to adapt to the speed of the game and physically if i don't do uh weight training during the week uh my body won't be able to to put up with the, the yeah. punishment in the physical side uh, i think there's a lot lot more closeness in the games than the athletes these days but some of the things you mentioned there you know the kind of up and back on defensive line it's like um it's like doing shovel runs you're doing groups of shovel yeah. runs uh, <laughs> except you have to tackle someone in between <laughs> yeah, and as you said, the tackle. That, sometimes oh, the tackles aren't tackles; they're just collisions. You know. They, yeah. And and I, so I, I wonder sometimes when I watch these these guys who played league for like ten, fifteen years, and I thought to myself, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but the technique of tackling you don't you don't do the old island way of smashing people all the time you, you there's a way of, of making sure to yeah. protect your body and yeah. there are other, other times you have to uh, if the if there's a big fella coming to you you have to go with them rather than try and and, yeah. and smash yeah. them so i i find that out after a few operations to my neck and my <laughs> neck and <laughs> yeah, yeah it was it was a very interesting i wish i could have uh, learned played the game a lot earlier mm. so I can um, mm. um, understand the finer point of uh, tackling. Yeah, it was... Well, yeah, yeah, no, look, very, very interesting what you're saying too around, around the tackling techniques that, that there is, um, yeah, there are some, some subtleties there between the games. But, and you mentioned then, you know, you had a string of injuries, but before that you made, you actually did make the Kiwis and you played about yep. five tests for the Kiwis. Um, yeah, we... What was uh, that experience we like? Yeah. yeah, oh, it was awesome. Um, you know, I missed out of, on the All Blacks and making the Kiwis was mm -hmm. as good for me. The, the, there was, wasn't many times we made the Kiwis before that. Yeah. I know of uh, the Mans. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Don Mann, the Man, Sal Man, there, no. Uh, what? Dwayne Mann, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some yeah. big names, yeah. Yeah. If the Dwayne's dad and George, George Mann. Yes. Uh, Kurt Sorensen's, the two Sorensen's. Um, uh, Watafe. Lulua is no, no. What Tafe? He was the winger from Palmerston North that made played for the Kiwis. Yeah, I, I, the names. I know the guy. You think it was way back. He was on the wing from Palmerston North. Um, yes, yeah. It's got to come to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, 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 um. Oh, it'll come. Yeah, yeah there were a string of, the, of of those players. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was, uh, I was, um, and we. Trials in Auckland, and we played France twice. One, one in uh, Auckland, and one in Christchurch. We both won that game, those two games, and then we played Australia in um, Melbourne. So, mm -hmm. in our teams, I think there was probably eight of um, new players in that in that team squad. Yeah, McCracken um, was there, Franabotica. Um, there was a few others. That made their we all made our debut together, uh, but so nobody really um, gave us any chance against Australia because uh, the first test in Melbourne, um, there was all the the Australians been dominating the league for many years, and then these young young team Tawera Nika was there, yeah mm -hmm. Tawera, our captain uh, South captain the halfback. Um, I can't remember now that some of the names. Um, played Australia in Australia. King 
Wally Lewis, I think that was his last yeah. game. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the those um, Australian players who's been around for years got got dropped after the first test. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Because we 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 beat them in in Melbourne, so that was a um, massive game for for us. Great experience. Yeah. That's that's a huge achievement, and you know. I'm just thinking with beating Australia and 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 Tonga in rugby league. We see the Mati Tonga and what they've done, and um, you know the players there nowadays. They're all playing in the, in the NRL. The professional players, you know, Andrew Fafita, David Fusitua, uh, William Hupuate. Um, yeah. What's what's been your your thoughts, your connections with Mati Tonga since finishing um, uh, your time playing rugby league? Well. Um, I was involved when, when Rugby Union was, uh, the World Cup was held here in New Zealand. I was mm-hmm. involved in, in, in uh, getting all the time support, supporters to support yeah. the team. You got a tahi, and then after that, there was a massive uh, successful for our Tongan teams and our supporters. And yeah, when yeah. the Rugby League and um, uh, Tonga Lolo and Fifita uh, played for Tonga, for the Marama Tonga, again, uh, there was a big uh, boost for our teams and our supporters, so it was really, really good to um, uh, yeah. to get this community behind the teams because these guys, these professional top players, were putting their hand up for little Tonga. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it must have been a huge feeling. Um, a small, not so small island nation like Tonga beating the best in the world. How did that feel amongst the Tongan community? What what was the feeling like amongst the people? Oh, it was awesome. A lot of that. we were so proud of the teams. Uh, we are we're always massive supporters of our rugby, whether it's rugby union, rugby league. But Marama Tonga has put Tonga at the you know at the top, beating Australia mm. and New Zealand. And uh, did we beat England? Yeah, we yeah, beat England. yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's that's. That's the that's the top you can go, beating the best of the best, and just looking at the Tongan players, you know the talents that we have. Uh, it's amazing how uh, if we all work together to bring all the top talented players together, even uh, the other uh, Fiji and Samoans and the Cook Islands, if they can do the same with their top players, I'm sure they will be up there competing yeah. with with, um, with the likes of uh, Australia and New Zealand and, and England. Yeah, there's there's a huge pool of talent in the Pacific who are seeing the players coming through, as you said, from the Cook Islands, Samoa, Tonga, playing in the NRL. Um, I think there'll be a fabulous concept to see a Pacifica team. So, yeah. life for you now, and we'll see you've, um, I was, you're mentioning earlier that injuries meant you finished playing probably a little bit earlier than you wanted to, and, and, but you stayed on living in, 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 in England and then came back home? Yeah, I... Um... I went over there. My when I left New Zealand to go and uh, play for Witness, my mum uh, told me to take my uh, my brother, my cousin, with me because she didn't want me to um, to go walk about in in England. <laughs> but <laughs> after three years, his visa ran out, so he came back to Tonga, and I was there by myself, and I got a bit uh, lonely. So. I ended up found uh, English Rose, married uh, the English lady. So when I retired, I was uh, I stayed there for another seven years, and uh, took me seven years uh, to persuade her to come back to talk to New Zealand to live, because we had a, a young one then, and yep. I wanted him to experience New Zealand. And, uh, and now back home, you're involved with local rugby with uh, and the Tongan rugby um, community scene as well. Yes, uh, we. We run a annual tournament here in, in Auckland, just for the Tongans. We have Auckland Tongan and uh, uh, after the club season, we, we have a, a tournament and we, we've we tried to promote, you know, there's a lot of uh, talents where they haven't made the uh, uh, minor 10 level, uh, even rugby league, there's yep. uh, minor 10 or two rugby. And, and we have our local tournaments and out of that tournament, we pick players and we call that the uh, Siutaka, which is a bit similar to Matama Tonga. Uh, mm. All these names, yeah, and national name, uh, team names, was um, named by either the king or the king's father. And uh, um, Siutaka is our uh, Tongan-based New Zealand players team. And we 
we've toured Australia, um, and they've had uh, tournaments in Tonga where the New Zealand um, base team would uh, participate. And out of their tournaments, some of those players I get picked for the Ikaretahi or, or the Fantastic. national team. Yeah, and other clubs would come and watch the tournaments and they would uh, uh, sign up some of the players. So there's is there opportunities there. Is there another Taniela Tupo in the wings out there running around in Auckland that um, oh, you're providing opportunities for? There's, there's uh, to be honest, there's a lot of players, talented uh, Tongans around and about, but a lot of them um, either missed the boat or just didn't have the the support around them when they were growing up. You know, um, they all, uh, most of them, um, don't have uh, identified at, at a younger age. You know, yeah. or even interested in in the game, but they have the body and the size, and you know, there's a lot of yeah. Daniela to pull. Tongan yeah. around. It's just that Daniela was able to uh, to play, uh, got involved with our, our school where there's yeah. professional coaching and training yeah. and, and had people around him to su support him and direct him. And uh, yeah. uh, there's, there's other players here, but we just haven't got the resources to, uh, you know, to train those yeah. talents. Well, you, you mentioned a good point, and that's having the support around you. That's a common thing that um, people have been talking about. And, and for yourself, I understand you're an accountant now. So you started off Teachers College, and now you're a qualified accountant. Yeah, we, I, I've tried, uh, I tried a business in England before I came back. That didn't go too well. And then um, had I set up a research company with my sister here in New Zealand, mm. uh, we couldn't compete with the universities. Uh, and then I just... Uh, um, then I start uh, working as a, um, an accountant here. I'm, I'm working for a chartered accountant in Auckland. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's where I met. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a fantastic story. Like you were saying earlier on, the days when you started off, there were people getting opportunities. And, you know, and, and you were saying earlier, you just missed, if you like, the professional big money that was going on. How important do you think it is giving a message to young people out there about ensuring they've got a career they've got a fallback plan oh it's very important and i think it's today's a lot of the um uh, kids who are uh, spotted uh, at a younger age they have to su support but um a lot of other players who come on late to the game and then have um, opportunities later on their, on their life they don't have that kind of support and sometimes um they don't get the, the right advice and directions. And it's like a couple of uh, players that I know that, that left school. They, they, had, uh, they were top at high school level, but uh, just didn't get, didn't get the opportunities to play Super Rugby here. Mm. And uh, an agent signed them up uh, at a very low uh, budget uh, contract. But then they work hard and, and they're in uh, top... Um, contract now yeah um, yeah yeah it's, yeah it's really important to get the right people around you um, the, 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 the problem with a lot of these kids uh, is not having uh, parents who are interested in in their sports in their rugby uh, just taking them to to the game is, is not enough you you know you have to mm. be able to uh, get other support other help from people who knows how to to uh, negotiate contract and yeah. and even yeah. uh, support them with career pathway and you know there's so many things that uh, is out there for those kids it's just uh, getting the, the right person to, to get out there go out there and get the, the support for them well Emosi I think you're a wonderful role model for those young people coming through coming all the way from the village in Tonga uh, school in Palmerston North where you're the only Tongan amongst maybe two or three other Pacifica, you know, playing with some of the All Blacks and representing Wellington and then going on to a professional career and witness the Kiwis and of course playing for Wainu Mata, that's a huge <laughs> achievement. Um, I'd just like to thank you uh, for your time of sharing your story about your family, about your journey, about the importance of education and support. So, um, you know, Malo, um um, my Lord Pito, and thank, thank you very much for your time, Emosi. Yep, thank you very much, Andre, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be part of this uh, interview. And, 
and I'm still out there helping our community and uh, hopefully all the ex-players can get back there again and, and support our, our young kids growing up. Yeah, Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mossy.